Welcome back to Greels Reels, everyone. Another milestone show for us today as we have our first general manager coming on and joining us for this evening, James Boyd. He is currently in the general manager position with the Ottawa 67s. We go through his whole hockey career and just kind of take a deep dive into everything that he's done. You know, for all of our Newfoundlanders listening today, he actually played with Daniel Cleary in Belleville, which is kind of funny because that's realistically how we kind of reconnected this week. So yeah, without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Do us a favor, share this with a friend. If you did, leave us a review. It really helps get these out to more and more people. But hey, without further ado, this is Greel's Reels. I'm your host, Robert Greeley. Enjoy. James, how's it going? It's good to see you. The uh, you know, it's another milestone here for Greel's Reels, the first official general manager front office guest that we have. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> uh, happy to do it and good to reconnect. Uh, things are going well. You know, we're here in Ontario, we're managing, you know, uh, whatever we can manage during the pandemic. So hockey's kind of popping up here and there and we're doing a bit of scouting and then, you know, providing support to the members of our team and that sort of thing. But it's been an interesting time for sure. Well, no, I mean, yeah, this is definitely unlike any other that we've seen in the hockey world. And like you said, yeah, it's nice to reconnect because funny enough, I ended up chatting with, uh, you know, one of your old teammates. And, you know, it's funny how the hockey world is so small because you, you got some new flying connections in the sense of guys that you've encountered. Like, I know we've chatted about Terry Ryan before. And then, of course, you know, you playing in Belleville with uh, Dan Cleary. Yeah, and so in some ways it's all connected, right? And I think when, you know, we're talking about a lifetime, it seems like a lifetime ago, but uh, yeah, I had a chance to play for two years with Danny in Belleville. And at the same time, we had, let's see, Corey Crocker was playing in Peterborough. Mm-hmm. And uh, Chris Pedman from Stephenville was playing in in Kitchener, and uh, so there was there was there was some uh, flavor from the rock spread throughout the league. And I know that times have changed there, but uh, that was uh, uh, it was exciting to play with Danny. He was a you know a heck of a player in junior, well documented, uh, and we had a great team there. But just a good group group of characters. It's funny how some of the teams he stayed connected with people, you know, through kind of you know of course scouting for the red wings at international events and that sort of thing and it's always great to catch up with him yeah i know when i when i was chatting with him he said you guys uh, were chatting like you know two weeks ago and whatnot so it's kind of cool how both of you guys have roles where i mean they coincide right obviously him working in player development for the red wings organization and yourself a general manager of a junior team that you know is constantly breeding prospects up to the league yeah it's like i said it's, it's neat to run in the you know, you got certain certain people that you stay connected with over the years. And when when you run into them, it's like, you know, turning back the hands of time. And Danny's definitely one of those guys. I really enjoy, you know, every time I see him or talk to him on the phone, there's always, you know, ideas are shared and, and uh, it's always very productive. Now, I want to chat about where it all kind of started for you. So, like, I know uh, Elite Prospects, as you listed as being born in Mississauga, is that like a true Mississauga guy yourself or – were you like one of those suburbs that kind of get uh, wrapped in with it? Well, that no, that's actually uh, that's a good question. I was I was born in Winnipeg, okay, <laughs> and then uh, I grew up in Midland, Ontario. So I grew up in small town Ontario, and uh, you know, kind of ideal like childhood town of twelve thousand five hundred, and uh, I played hockey there and played all sorts of other sports. But uh, I moved to uh, Toronto or Mississauga uh, when I was in high school to play hockey, and. Uh, and so the, the Mississauga stuck. That's where I was drafted from. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was playing for the same Mike's Buzzers, but I was living in Mississauga. So I should probably send him a note to change that. There's <laughs> probably some people in Midland who get their feathers up on that. But that, yeah, grew up in Midland and then, uh, you know, transitioned to the city. I played junior hockey um, with the same Mike's Buzzers. And then I played, uh, I was drafted to Kitchener Rangers, played a year in Kitchener. And then I played a year with the Ottawa 67s and then two years in Belleville. So that small town, Ontario, Midland kind of vibe, is that where the hockey kind of passion grew in the sense of just, you know, small town, it's a good way to spend some free time without getting yourself into too much trouble? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of it. That's kind of, it. you know, like I said, I played all sports, uh, but, you know, my father's a big hockey fan and, you know, coached the teams when I was a kid and uh, was pretty heavily involved. But also at the time, there's some pretty good, pretty good players um, coming out of Midland. So, uh you know, there was uh, Chris Contos was playing in the National Hockey League and Todd Alec and, uh, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, Blair and Brian McReynolds uh, who were NHL players. So for a small town, there was, you know, it was kind of, you know, it was present, you know, and at the, at the same time, 
uh, you know, in the town. Russ Howard was the world curling champ who was from the town. And Brian Orser was the world figure skating champ from the town. So it's kind of this incubator of sports, I guess. But it was an exciting time to be there because of all the excitement in the town, uh, you know, at that time. But the, the hockey was definitely my passion and had a chance, you know, when I was like in my teen years, make a decision. Am I going to take this seriously or, or uh, uh, you know, continue on? So my brother, my brother decided to ski and I decided to play hockey. And uh, <laughs> that kind of led into one opportunity into another. And, and so I've been very fortunate. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I get a lot of same kind of thing with new plan vibes where especially that Dan Cleary era, era, you know, we've had, you know, Caitlin Osmond go on to be an Olympic medalist in figure skating. And then, you know, like you said, Dan Cleary, Michael Ryder, like that kind of group. It's funny that sometimes there's just like a, a certain age group from this point to that point in small towns that for some reason they just, I would say, exceed expectations, right? But for you, was it getting drafted to the Kitchener Rangers where it was like, okay, I, I've got something here with hockey? Yeah, I think so. I think it was, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's when – Probably the year before, the same when I played the same Mike's Buzzers in Junior A, that was when it it really clued in that hey, there's some opportunity here. Uh, and you know we had a pretty good team, and we had a number of players who were drafted on the team. Actually, Craig Mills, uh, who ended up playing in Belleville with Danny and myself, uh, he was drafted uh, from that same Mike's team. Cam White, uh, who ended up you know having a, a pretty good minor league career, uh, was drafted off that team. So there's uh, Aaron Brand, who became the OHL's leading scorer, was on that team. So there was some excitement around the team, you know. Like there was a, definitely uh, uh, some momentum going there. So that was when I really realized, oh, this might be, you know, this might be an opportunity here. Um, but uh, you know, like I said, from there it, it just kind of one opportunity turned into another, and uh, you know, each year blends into the next, and uh, it was it was very fun. It's a fun ride. So now how do you navigate going from, you know, real star studded locker room in like junior A into now you're a rookie in the Rangers and you're dealing with that kind of atmosphere in the locker room now where you've kind of had a role reversal in a way? Yeah, that was so my first year of junior would be in the realization that, oh boy, you know, <laughs> this is this is pretty serious stuff. And, you know, you start to realize there that you know, when you look at the players that drafted, I mean, players that were in Kitchener at the time, Todd, like Todd Warner would be an example. They do one thing really, really well, you know? And so, you know, there's a lot of good players, but there's uh, the guys that seem to move on are the guys that do one thing exceptionally well. So, you know, you can, you get an idea that, Hey, I got to start specializing in something or, uh, you know, I got to, I got to start paying more attention here, but that it was a, uh, uh, that was a tough transition. My first year, actually, I played junior. I was I was up and down between the junior A team and the, and the OHL team, so uh, a little bit of transitional period there. And uh, but it was it, it was it, it's still it's a great league, and it's a difficult transition into the league because you know you're you're now now you're on the ice for the first time with guys that are signed to NHL contracts, guys that are playing for the World Junior Team, guys that are going to the NHL at the end of the season. You know, so it's a, it's a different level of seriousness there for sure. What did you realize would be your thing to specialize in? Well, it, uh, uh, you know, I became a checking forward. Um, and, you know, grow a grinder. Coaches, coaches love those type of players. <laughs> you recognize that right away. They, hey, there's a chance, uh, chance to carve out a niche on the team doing that sort of a role. So. Uh, you know, it's kind of the, the coaches are good at giving you a helping hand too, and describing what they, <laughs> you know, where the ice time is and, and uh, you know, the, if you adapt and the opportunity is yours. So I say it was, you know, not so much a decision, but more steered in that direction uh, in order to help the team. So, um, you know, that, that was really where as a, you know, grinding forward, a, a check, checking role, that, that was uh, kind of my bread and butter throughout my junior career. Now, when you switched over to the 67s, do you find it's giving you a little bit of an advantage now as a general manager where you kind of know what it's like to be a player for that organization? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. I think that there's uh, there's still a, no a number of people in the organization that, you know, were around at that time. So it's nice to have that familiarity. I think that, the, you know, knowing the city uh, was an advantage or at least, you know, having a leg up coming in. Uh, but the league has changed so much. You know, it's like there's almost not even the, the, the same league. The 
the size of the staffs. Uh, you know, when I, when I look at back at the time with the 67s, uh, Peter Lee was the coach. Uh, Vince Millette was the assistant coach. And Brian Kilray was the general manager. And that was kind of it. You know, <laughs> there was there was a marketing guy and there was, you know, uh, there was an education lady, uh, Teresa Kelly. But there was, you know, the staff was extremely small. Now, uh, you know, we have a staff of 12 people, you know, that support the team. And and the supports that are in place, we have full-time tutoring. We have a full-time strength and conditioning coach. We have, you know, a goalie coach who's on staff working with the guys every day. We have, a, um, you know, a, a billet and education advisor, Eileen Duffin, who's, you know, a, she's an employee. She works every day, you know, supporting the players and and, and helping them out. So uh, it's almost, you know, become a professional environment with the supports for the players now. It's a totally different animal. So, you know, I... I was familiar with that because if I've stayed in the league for so long. It wasn't, you know, I've seen that progression happen. It's progression, you know, that I'm enthusiastic about. I really believe in it, but it's a totally different environment from when I played in Ottawa. You mentioned Brian, and I'm kind of curious in the sense now because you're almost his predecessor. As you know, you were on the team when he was uh, when you were a player, and now obviously, you know, you're in one of his old roles, yeah. following up somebody who you know was argue, you know, in the debate section of probably one of the greatest coaches of all time in junior hockey. I mean, what's that like? And I know he's still pretty heavily involved and, you know, comes up every now and then when, you know, before the shutdown for uh, different, uh, you know, big games and stuff like that. So you still see him around. Do you get to yeah. kind of pick his brain much? Yeah, a lot. So, you know, in a, in a normal year, uh, Brian, you know, he's in his eighties, but he still scouts regularly. Mm -hmm. Brian and Bert O'Brien, who is his uh, longtime assistant coach there in Ottawa kind of the Batman and Robin, they, they, they scout for us and they see games every week. So they're still involved with the scouting meetings. They're still involved in, uh, you know, kind of the, the seasonal planning. And of course at games, I get a chance to sit with those guys. And the, the, the one thing is they'll tell you exactly what they think, you know, <laughs> about the team and about players. And, the, and they're usually right. You know, the wealth of experience, where else are you going to get that? And, you know, there's part of it that, you know, a uh, killer, you know, we have a relationship. He's, he's my friend now. You know, like we, uh, those guys golf every week. It's great. I love it. But, uh, you know, to have that resource, you know, Hall of Famer with uh, that many years of junior hockey and, you know, players struggling and on our, on our team and you ask him his opinion, he's going to give you three reasons. They're, you know, we're really, <laughs> really good opinions and food for thought. So I really enjoy talking to him. Uh, his bluntness is uh, <laughs> appreciated. And, uh, you know, he's, he's the genuine article, like what you, what you see or what you hear about Brian Keller is exactly what he's like. There's no, there's no bluff. There's no pretend that's what he is. And, uh, and so it's great to have him around. I'm curious, has there ever been a moment where you're like, you hear one of his opinions or something like that and you have the complete opposite take and you're like, the gears are going in your head where you're like, how, how do I navigate saying this as politely and respectfully as possible? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. If there's ever been situations where it's the exact opposite take, but we have a back and forth. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I can tell him exactly what I think and we don't have to agree on things, but you know, especially with the draft, you know, he's, we got sometimes different opinions on players, but I, I think there's a mutual respect there. Uh, but you know, we can agree to disagree. But I think the important part is, someone with killer's personality what's so uh, so valuable is that it, it g generates dialogue you know he's honest about his opinion and he's going to ask some you know difficult questions and he's he's going to be firm but at the end of the day we can you know agree to disagree and we can go have a beer and and you know talk and continue dog hockey so i think that that's important i think for any franchise to have people uh able to express themselves and not be fearful of expressing their opinion i think killer kind of leads that charge you know, in a lot of ways, because, um, you know, he's, he's inclusive, uh, you know, so our scouts, I'm sure it's a treat for our scouts to be in a meeting with Brian Keller, I get his opinion on players and his insights and that sort of thing. So it's, it, like I said, it's invaluable, uh, to bring in, you know, I don't think you could bring in someone like that, uh, you know, that lives and breathes the, or, the franchise or the organization that has all this, you know, this walking, talking historian, uh, you know, who is, uh, on the front lines for that many years. It's just tremendous. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because sometimes, you know, I've found myself in locker rooms and situations where it's like, oh man, like I, you know, 
want to give my opinion here, but I, I'm the 23 year old kid. Like, how do I make sure I'm not coming off as this hotshot who thinks he knows it all? Right. Yeah. 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 Well, that's where I, you know, I mentioned it clear killers inclusive, mm. you know, I think that, you know, part of his, his experience and his wealth of knowledge is, is knowing that, you know, everyone, everyone's got a valid opinion. And, you know, when we look at the draft, you get, I mean, well, the NHL draft is another thing, but the OHL draft, you can get three or four players of an OHL draft consistently out of the 15 rounds. You, you might, you're probably going to win a championship, you know, or you're going to come close. So we're wrong a lot of the time. So you, you have to have thick skin, but you have to constantly be evaluating the way that you're doing things, the way you're thinking about things, the way you're, you know, looking at players and that's all dialogue. It's communication, it's dialogue, it's, you know, asking difficult questions. And then when you get it wrong, it's, you know, having the, you know, be able to look back and say, where, you know, why was that? Why did, why did we go wrong? Why, 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 what were we looking at there? And that's where, uh, you know, killer gives, can give some uh, blunt opinions that help to uh, move things along. <laughs> For sure. Going back <laughs> to your playing days now, you know, where you get off to Belleville and that section of your career, I'm yeah. curious, these are trades, correct? Yeah, that's trades. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you get traded to Belleville, what's kind of like your first thoughts in the sense, like, are you excited for the new opportunity? Are things coming up like, Oh, I'll get to play with a guy like Cleary, you know, who was obviously highly scouted putting up a hundred points at the time. Uh, no, you know what? It was more that Ottawa was going into a rebuild. Uh, mm -hmm. We hadn't had the best year the year before. Uh, and uh, killer was stepping back behind the bench. So there was, there was some, you know, upheaval in the organization there. And I was just happy to, you know, find a spot to continue playing. <laughs> but I'd known some of the guys in Belleville, like I mentioned, Craig Mills, who I played, you know, Junior A with, and I became, you know, I knew the league pretty well, but I knew that they had a, a decent team there. Uh, Sean Brown on defense, you know, who's just been a first rounder of the Boston Bruins. And so it was exciting that, hey, you know what, there's an opportunity here to win a bunch of games and have some fun. And so there was a comfort level going into the team. And then, you know, Larry Mavity, the late Larry Mavity, um, you know, I, I had a sense that, you know, I was this type of player, <laughs> you know, just the way the teams played. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of ways to look at a trade, but I, the way that I choose to look at it is there's, there's a team that wants you, you know, I know there's a, there's a pessimistic view as well that, uh, some people take, but I say, Hey, you know what, I'm excited that a team, you know, believes in me and wants me and there's a new opportunity there. So it ended up working out great in Belleville. And that, you know, that's the team that doesn't exist doesn't exist anymore uh you know the, the Belleville of course became the Hamilton Bulldogs moved away from that town was replaced by a American Hockey League team but you know the Belleville Bulls at the time were really uh a family-owned enterprise so a local physician Dr. Robert Vaughn owned the team uh his son Brad was uh involved with management and you know we used to go over to Doc Vaughn's house for dinner we used to hang out at the owner's house and like it was a unique scenario that I don't think will ever happen again but um you know, being in a town that small and being, you know, the team was really the center of attention at the time. And, uh, you know, having the support from the Vaughn family and, and it was really unique. It was a special time. What's it like not really being able to go back and really see, I guess, an old stadium or like, you know, the Belleville Bulls, because obviously, you know, if you're a 67s alumni, you can go back and watch a game and see the same kind of sweaters that you wore once upon a time, but you don't really get that as a Bulls alumni now. Yeah, it's very, very different. Like the, the arena has been redone. So it's been upgraded and they, you know, they've added seating and box, you know, private, private suites and whatever. And so it's an American hockey league rink. The other, the other thing that sticks out is it used to be Olympic ice. So it was the only rink in the OHL that had Olympic ice size. Uh, that's, that's now NHL size to accommodate the American league team. So the rink is totally different, but I always found that, you know, whether it's a Kitchener or there's an, an Ottawa, you know, as an alumni, it's always, not the same when you go back, you know, it's different when you're on the team, but, um, but when Belleville moved to Hamilton for me, that, that was a tragedy, you know, that's a junior hockey tragedy because I know so, you know, so many people in the town, what the team meant to them and, you know, the importance of having a team in Belleville for that whole Eastern conference for the Kingston's, the Ottawa's uh, and the rivalries, you know, when we were, Daniel, Danny Clary will tell you when we were playing the Kingston and Belleville rivalry was, I don't know, you know, I, I haven't come across anything that compares to that. You know, it didn't matter where any team was in the standings, 
is a Friday night Kingston Belleville game, big crowd. You know, it was a it was a rugged game. There were skilled players on, you know, both teams. It, it was, you know, it's 20 years of hatred there. <laughs> so it's, uh, it was unique for sure. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, the American League team's there now and they get supported uh, uh, well in the town, but uh, that'll always be a junior hockey town for me. I'm curious, what do you think is the league's best representation of that Kingston Belleville rivalry now today? Well, that's a good one. Uh, Kitchener London has a good, pretty strong rivalty, rivalry. Uh, Sudbury Sault Ste. Marie uh, has always been uh, you know, kind of key dates to circle on the calendar. And there's a few, there's a few other ones that, you know, percolate depending on how competitive the teams. Oshawa Peterborough has always been a rivalry. Uh, but there was something about that uh, Kingston Belleville, yeah. you know, Larry Mavity, who I mentioned that uh, who sadly passed away this year, but a legend in junior hockey circles, uh, Mav kind of oscillated between Kingston, he coached in Belleville and then he went to Kingston and coached for a few years and then back to Belleville, you know, for, uh, for a decade and then back to Kingston, uh, you know, and Mav had uh, these rugged teams that uh, very competitive. And so there was, there's, there's a different element there. And, you know, the, the close proximity of the towns, you know, being less than an hour apart from rink to rink, that it was just, uh, it was unique. And maybe, maybe it's different when you live it, but I, I didn't experience that with any of the other teams that I've been associated with over the years. Fair enough. Now, you mentioned Belleville had that Olympic ice when you were playing there. Was that kind of a reason why you committed to Guelph? Because I, I'm assuming they had Olympic ice back then too, because they, they still do have that rink there now. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, correct. Uh, no, it had nothing to do with it. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, uh, you know, just, I, I think a coincidence, but there was a lot of, there was a number of players from Guelph who ended up, or sorry, from Belleville who ended up playing in Guelph. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of pipeline there. Uh, and from the national championship team in 1996, uh, Chris Clancy, former Belleville bull. Uh, we had Joe, Joe and Mike Van Volsen, um, uh, you know, who played for the team. We had Mike Lavelle, who was there. We had Mark Gowan, who was our starting goalie when they played in Belleville. So, you know, sometimes you get these connections and, uh, you know, you're familiar with the team because, you know, a bunch of guys that play there. But really the key for me was Guelph had won the national championship the year before and I knew a bunch of guys there and they had a, you know, great reputation and it was uh, close to my house and it's a great school and it's just a, a natural fit, so. Is it weird to almost see guys like, I mean, I know you brought Chioto in at the trade deadline there a couple of years ago, and now he just, you know, committed to Guelph. Is it weird to almost see guys take a very similar path to yourself now, so many years later? Uh, well, I say I encourage them, <laughs> you know, over the years, there's, I had a great time in Guelph. What, you know, it was a tremendous school. It's got great facilities. It's, uh, uh, you know, centrally located in Ontario. And, you know, if players ask me, I tell them, you know, uh, you'll have the time of your life, but I'm also biased because I'm, you know, I, involved with the alumni there and, uh, you know, head coach Sean Camp and Chris Clancy, who I mentioned is one of the assistant coaches. So I was on a Zoom call with them uh, just last month uh, with some of the alumni and some of the players. So uh, it's a special place. I'm sure that uh, most people feel strongly about, uh, you know, the, the, their schools, but uh, golf has a great program. And like I mentioned, the new, the new athletic facilities and, uh, uh, that are there it's a uh, it's a great place to be yeah I'm not gonna lie my heart is hurting right now because as a University of Ottawa alumni and you know working in the sport with varsity athletics there I've had two playoff exits courtesy of the Griffins uh, I've been a part of a Queen's Cup that went to three overtimes that Guelph came out on top on the other side and uh, you know even the playoff run that I got to kind of tag along with you guys just going to the city in, in Guelph and watching them, uh, you know, win the OHL championship that year. It just, uh, that city just has not been kind to me whatsoever. <laughs> it's your house of horrors down there. <laughs> well, you have to go back in the summertime when there's no hockey being played because it's, uh, it's a beautiful place. Now, you only played two seasons at Guelph. What were you studying through at that time? Uh, history, and poly history and political science. Okay. So uh, nothing to do with my <laughs> current employment. But, the, you know, the transition in, into coaching happened, and I tell the young, you know, sports management students or people who reach out for advice, I tell them, you don't want to hear this next part of the story. Because, you know, what happened, I left Guelph, or I left Belleville, I played in Guelph, and then uh, just by good fortune, 
uh, and, you know, in hindsight, good fortune. The assistant coach there was uh, Freddie Boyens, director of former Toronto Maple Leaf. And he uh, was stepping aside. He was a train engineer at the time uh, with CN Rail, I, I believe. And so there's an opportunity there. And uh, so they reached out to alumni or they reached out, you know, me. And uh, I had an opportunity there to go back and join Luke Crawford, um, uh, you know, on the coaching staff. So at the time, I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, and I thought I knew what I was doing, but you get you get involved with that at the time and uh, realize quickly, oh boy, like this is a steep learning curve here. Up until that point, I'd never considered coaching while I was playing. You know, my my goal was I was going to finish you know my university studies and then go down play in the minor league somewhere uh, mm -hmm. for a couple of years, and then get on with life. Uh, and that was the reality. So you know, I took the job with the intention of I'll do this for a year and then see where it goes. Well. So back with the Vaughn family, which I was familiar with, and I started, well, Lou Crawford at the time, uh, you know, they had an excellent team. They lost the Memorial Cup the year before to Ottawa 67, or in the Memorial Cup, the Ottawa 67s had won. But we had kind of the residue of those teams. So we had an excellent team. Um, and uh, at the end of the year, Lou was promoted to the St. John's Leafs. So Lou went on to the American Hockey League. Jim Halton came in. I continued on and, you know, one year became the next. There was about five or six years where, you know, I tell my mom that I was going back to, you know, graduate school and at the end of the season. And then I just either by promotion or, you know, different opportunities, I ended up staying with it. And here we are, we're 20, 20 something years later uh, of, uh, um, you know, involvement in junior hockey. But those years in Belleville, like I said, I played there. I, you know, feel strongly about the town there. I have so many friends and, uh, it was just, you know, uh, it was just a perfect fit. And then Jim Halton left in 2004, 2005, 2005 to go coach the Kingston Frontenacs. There's the Belleville Kingston, uh, rivalry there again. And I became the head coach in Belleville when I was 20, 27 years old. So that was really, uh, that was the moment in my coaching career or involvement, you know, in junior hockey career where I said, Oh, wait a second, maybe I can, you know, get a job coaching hockey here for, longer than if you know a cup of coffee fair enough and now so correct me if i'm wrong you're probably like what 23 24 in that first coaching job with the belleville oh younger than that yeah, we, okay. we had uh, like i'll give you an example mark chaplin uh you know from st john's was uh, on the team as a 16 year old or 17 year old when i was an overage and he was still on the team when i was when i came back coaching so some of the guys on the team i'd played with when I got back coaching. So I was 20, 21, 21 or 22 at the time, but it was fresh, you know, like it was, uh, uh, I was, you know, right out of school and back into it, but you know, probably that was an advantage because I knew a lot of the players and I knew, you know, the billet families were the same, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of, I kind of went back into the same environment, but, uh, yeah, I was young at the time for sure. Yeah, because I'm curious what that dynamic was like, because I've seen it sometimes in the sense with other locker rooms where, you know, guys go on, they finish their eligibility, and then they're right back in coaching with a bunch of guys that they played. And sometimes it's like, you know, there is a level of respect, but other times it's just like, man, like, you know, who are you to tell me what to do? Like, you were literally here with me la like two years ago. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, uh, yeah, there's probably we could dissect that one. That's probably a totally different uh, segment. But, uh, you know, what would really, you know, the, the, the solve for any coaching inexperience or, uh, um, you know, trouble would be, you know, having a good team. And we had a great team. So, you know, we had a uh, Branislav Meze, who's the 10th overall pick to the National Hockey League, um, was one of our defensemen. and He played half an hour. So, you know, he's six foot five, 245 pounds, and he plays half an hour. Well, it makes it a little easier, you know, in your first year of coaching. And, we, you know, we had uh, John Chichu was on that team. Justin Papineau, Ryan Reddy was on the team the year before that went to the Memorial Cup. So, like I said, there's a residue there from winning that, uh, um, you know, made it an easy transition. I think if perhaps the team was in a rebuild or struggling a bit, that for sure wouldn't have gotten as much leash or a uh, learning opportunity, but it's always, it's easier to learn when, when the team's doing well and you have really good players. That being said, the most I've ever learned is when the team is not doing well, uh, you know, and you're forced to, uh, you know, to come up with different strategies and solutions. I've kind of run the gamut of, you know, we've had good teams, we've had bad teams, but that first year having a really strong team uh, definitely uh, helped. 
Now, when you're 27 getting a head coaching job in the OHL, imposter syndrome is a term that's being used more and more nowadays. Just a lot of creatives, different type of people in the spotlight, they sometimes feel like they don't deserve that. Is that at that moment, is that like a reflection of how you were feeling? Like, man, like, how is this happening right now? Or are you like, no, like, Hey, let, let's go. I, I got this here. No, I was, uh, it was more, let's go, you know? Yeah. And then because I'd been there, I'd been there for a long time and it was still the same dynamic, you know, the, the Vaughn family owned the team and it was kind of this, this had been the succession plan and here you go. Now we had gone for it, you know, in the playoffs for a couple of years in a row and traded off some assets and that sort of thing. So this was the total rebuild. So the plan was, you know, we're going to play the young kids and we'll trade away the older guys and it'd be a difficult year. And, um, and, and it was, and, uh, but they had an excellent draft at the end of the year. And the unfortunate part is the team was sold shortly after. So we went through the difficult year. We felt we had a great draft, but then uh, we were all dismissed, you know, <laughs> following the draft. So uh, that was the tough part was not being able to continue uh, you know, with that group that we, we, we kind of, we'd been through the tough, the tough time. But so anyway, it's created a new opportunity. And I ended up shortly after at St. Mike's with uh, Dave Cameron, uh, Dave Cameron Harbor at St. Mike's and, uh, you know, kind of turned the page there and moved on to a new, a new experience. But, um, you know, it's those rebuilding years in junior hockey, I find it's, it's difficult for those coaches to finish what they started. You know, and sometimes uh, the philosophy uh, changes at the top or it's uh, it's always best laid plans, uh, you know, when you're deciding to have a difficult year, but it often doesn't work out. So anyway, that was a learning experience and the team went on to have success and I cheered for them in the playoffs, uh, you know, uh, uh, when they were when they were doing well. And that's the way it goes. Now, when you make that move to St. Mike's, it's still a little bit of familiarity with you obviously being in that Toronto area and having history around but it, would you accredit that maybe in your staff career being the first time that you really maybe got out of your comfort zone uh yeah yeah maybe so well I'll tell you what it was difficult about that or different about that experience was we went from the Olympic ice in Belleville to what's probably the smallest ice in the history of junior hockey at St. Mike's Arena you know, where the actual face-off circles are touching the boards. So we went from, and the teams were, were designed, uh, you know, uh, to, to kind of for home ice advantage. And ironically, probably what led to the opportunity with St. Mike's was we had playoff series against them uh, in, in uh, uh, two years previous, two years previous, where neither team could win at home. Or, sorry, neither team could win on the road. We had this small, fast team. St. Mike's had this giant team. And uh, so it was kind of a blow to either, either team's uh, <laughs> uh, home, home ice advantage. But it was really a competitive series. And uh, so we gained a mutual respect there with Dave. And then Dave hired me. But the interesting part about that scenario was I got hired at St. Mike's, which was my you know alma mater. I had gone to high school there, played junior there. Uh, but then Dave uh, was promoted and went to the American League. So Bud Stefanski came in and I got to coach with Bud for a couple of years. And Bud's a guy who's had, you know, a ton of success in the OHL. He'd been to the Memorial Cup a number of times. And uh, so there's another learning experience, but it was all intertwined because the St. Mike's team was owned by Eugene Melnick. Of course, the Ottawa Senators owner who owned mm -hmm. at the time the Binghamton Sen Senators in the American Hockey League, as, as well as the NHL Senators. So Dave went from St. Mike's to Binghamton and then returned to St. Mike's uh, a few years later. Uh, so I, I kind of became the constant there. <laughs> I stayed and the head coaches, uh, you know, shuffled and we had some success. We went to the, you know, host the Memorial cup in 2011. And at the same time, Dave was coaching the world junior team and it was an exciting time. And then Dave, of course, went to the NHL uh, following that Memorial cup year. And I assumed the, the head coach responsibilities, head coach GM responsibilities. So, um, a little bit of movement there, but the same way a special place. You know, for me, the iconic high school, uh, you know, the, the hockey history, I don't know, 100 and, 100 and a half uh, players in the NHL, uh, you know, uh, when you walk into the old arena there, um, you know, the pictures on the walls from everyone from Eric Lindros to uh, Jerry Cheevers, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a hockey shrine. So it was, it was 
it was a unique, unique experience, not only the ice surface, but just uh, being around that group. Of course, hockey is difficult to sell in Toronto too, which went from, went from in Belleville, you know, the kind of the hottest ticket in town to at St. Mike's, sometimes 800 or 700 fans in the stands. Uh, so there was a lot of challenges there, but it was a great learning experience. And I benefited from working with some really smart hockey guys uh, the whole way along. Yeah, St. Mike's is a private all-boys school, right? That correct, yeah. So funny enough, my roommate in first year university was St. Mike's grad, like uh, alumni, like he, him and all of his brothers went there. Okay. So obviously uh, we ended up getting into an argument one night because I, I <laughs> grew up in small town, Newfoundland, like classic public school, right? And we're, he was, you know, oh, you got to go private, like it's better. And I'm just like, no, like public school, obviously, like holding the pride, trying to, you know, stick my foot down for the, my alma mater as well, right? And I ended up winning the argument because eventually after like 30 minutes of going back and forth and getting pretty heated, I was like, Hey, at this, at the end of the day, I said, me and you were in the exact same room at the exact same institution. The only difference is, is my parents didn't pay for my yeah, high yeah. school and yours did. Well, that's a, that, 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 that's a pretty good debate. I know you had your work cut out for you because that, you know, and I was, I was fortunate. I was to attend a number of schools during my hockey career moving around, of course, but. St. Mike's was a, a unique place, and mm -hmm. but I know the St. Mike's guys are a proud bunch. So you would have had your work cut out in that debate. No, a hundred percent. It was, uh, yeah, it was. It got pretty heated. It went on for a good 30, 40 minutes for sure, much longer than it probably should have. <laughs> right on. And it was funny the names that you listed off. That was I, I still remember him like arguably and angrily listing off those guys, being like, "This is our alumni. Who do you guys have?" And I'm like. Nope, myself, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they, they, I'm telling you, with that, that old St. Mike's Arena there and the pictures on the wall of the NHL alumni, it, it stretches, you know, more mm -hmm. than 100 yards. It's an impressive thing to see. And, uh, you know, that continues. You know, players coming out of St. Mike's, you know, it, attract, it, it attracts top students, top athletes, you know, players. Like, I look at uh, games I've been watching this week at Jamie Drysdale. You know, for a world junior, uh, uh, you know, team this year and first round picking Anaheim Ducks, same Mike's guy. You know, it seems there's always the same Mike's guy in, in, the, in the group there. But just with the sheer volume of players here in Toronto and, you know, the competitiveness of their teams, the quality of their school, they attract those athletes. So that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. Tyler Sagan was another one of those guys, too. If Correct. Yeah. Jason Spezza, uh, you know, it continues. <laughs> it continues. The <laughs> list is long. Yeah. I feel like we might end up getting into that same argument there now if we keep continuing on with uh no it's uh it's cool though I must say I, hopefully he's not listening to this episode because I will kind of give it to him like I mean the <laughs> alumni there is uh yeah. it is pretty impressive yeah it is for sure now at that time too you're you became director of uh, hockey operations as well so you're seeing for the first time in your career uh multiple roles and joint responsibilities managing that how did you go about it uh, well, I think, you know, uh, we were fortunate to have an expanded staff. You know, this, this is really the time where, you know, we started taking on or spreading out responsibilities a little bit. So, uh, you know, we had a dedicated head scout and, uh, uh, and Jimmy Cassidy. We had a full-time, uh, you know, two, two assistant coaches. Uh, and actually, for one of those years, Jim Holton, we were reunited. Uh, Jim coached with Dave and I at St. Mike's before he went to the Florida Panthers. So. Um, you know, it's de is delegating is really the key to, you know, as he is kind of, you get more responsibilities and more support for the players and uh, you have to be able to delegate responsibilities. So once again, I was lucky to, you know, fortunate to be surrounded by some really smart people and was able to, uh, uh, you know, trust them to do their jobs. And uh, the one thing about being at, you know, in uh, the GTA there is most players in Ontario come through Toronto during the season. So there's not too much trial. You're not driving to the outer reaches to watch players. They're generally coming to you and sometimes to the building. So it, uh, uh, it made for an interesting uh, uh, transition because we, we moved from St. Mike's Arena, which is downtown Toronto, to the Hershey Center in Mississauga, which is a modern building, expanded building. So we became the uh, Mississauga St. Mike's Majors. And then I transitioned with that team as well through an ownership change and became the Mississauga Steelheads. So... I was in one spot for 12 years. I was kind of, you know, I was a, as a assistant coach and assistant general manager. Then I was a 
head coach and general manager, and then I became the general manager. And but in that time, uh, you know, we, we were able to go to the uh, the OHL finals twice, and with two different ownership groups and two different uh, franchises. But there was a lot of continuity there, so I was fortunate to be able to to stay on. Yeah, because that was actually something I was going to ask in the sense of, you know, as they're changing their names and their logos and you're going through a rebrand, you're also changing roles. But when you go from like, you know, Toronto, Mississauga, uh, St. Mike's and Steelheads, are you like, are you paying much heed to that as like somebody who has all these responsibilities in terms of like head coach, GM, or is that just kind of like, all right, is what it is kind of thing? Yeah, I did. That's an interesting point, right? Uh, you know, why there's, it wasn't something that was sudden. You know, when they, we, we were the same Mike's franchise, we were for sale for a year. So, which made for another interesting season because, you know, during that season, you've got all these different potential buyers being toured through the facility and, you know, meeting the coaching staff. It's almost like you're, uh, you know, auditioning for a spot on the new team that's the same team that you're on at the time. It's, Cesaro. But anyway, um, you know, the team was purchased and uh, the new ownership, uh, Elliot Kerr, who had some experience in the league, um, you know, had been a, uh, previously an owner of Mississauga Ice Dogs and then with the Guelph Storm. So he had a keen eye on the league and he knew the personnel there. And when the team was sold, he said, you know, he said, hey, listen, uh, I like your style and we want you to stay on with us, uh, which was different, you know, than the previous uh, sale of the team there in Belleville. So uh, we got along great and it was you know, the, the team name changed and, uh, you know, Elliot was able to, uh, you know, impart some of his philosophy and, and some changes, but for our staff, I mean, the equipment manager was the same. Uh, you know, a lot of the staff, Jimmy Cassidy, who I mentioned as their uh, head scout was the same. So there was some continuity there too, which made it a lot easier. Now, when you find yourself in that head coach and GM role, I just assume that's got to be a headache in the sense where like, you have to coach a kid and then potentially also bring him into the office at the same time and be like, Hey, uh, we did this deal. You're out of here. Yeah. You have to compartmentalize both jobs, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, um, I, I think that that's, it's difficult to do. It's, it's nice to have the, the influence to be able to change the team or to make a change where, you know, you, you think it's necessary. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, you do have to wear many hats and you have to be able to, to keep the long-term, you know, uh, keep the long-term health of the franchise top of mind while you're trying to, you know, win <laughs> as many games as possible. So, you know, you have to be able to balance the two and it's all about, it's all about the health of the, of the team and what's best for the team and the franchise. And you kind of got to, you got to walk the walk there because you can make a couple of trades and, and, you know, have a successful two months you know, which looks good on the coach, but uh, really the job of the GM is to ensure that long-term health of the franchise. So I think that uh, it's a lot of work though. You know, I think uh, as I had our young family here expanded and uh, uh, you know, the, the league responsibilities continue to become more and more, uh, which I mentioned is great. I think uh, it became too difficult for me to do both jobs and do a good job at mm-hmm. both. So, you know, we kind of had uh, uh, head coach, general manager and dad pick two. <laughs> can't do three you know that's how I felt so uh, I made the transition to general manager and uh, uh, you know it's been it's been a great experience so far now I'm curious because sometimes in sports we see these debates in the media and speculation sometimes where people are a little bit confused as to why maybe one guy is starting as opposed to the other guy now mind you this is kind of more of a pro statement where you know you get contracts and money involved and essentially it almost becomes a lot harder to bench a guy who say, you know, in a football standpoint, you're paying like $30 million when maybe the better option for the head coach to play is the younger guy who actually, you know, is looking a little bit more impressive, but you know, right now they're only kind of paying him 800,000 and it's a big thing. And there's a lot of egos at play when you got to sit somebody who especially got that contract extension from, you know, another member of the staff and, you know, all of a sudden your bench is worth a lot more than, probably what maybe should be out on the field when you take both of those roles that kind of eliminates that factor but you're still almost like battling I guess and decisions that you make in terms of the office to now trying to like really prove that they work 
how do you make sure that you're not getting caught up in, you know, maybe sometimes those movements that you made to be like, okay, you know what? I was wrong in this aspect, but this is going to be for the betterment of the team as a coach right now. Yeah. Well, I think if there's, you know, a, a coach and general manager are two different people or the same person, it's the same, same decisions have to be made. You know, the mm -hmm. problems don't go away. So you're always balancing player development, you know, and, and making sure those young players are getting enough ice time and, and coming along versus the older players who have, you know, put in their time with the franchise and feel that they deserve more, you know, the bulk of the opportunity. So I think, you know, it's, uh, it all comes down to communication. You know, it's cliched, but any business management or, you know, any high level coaching conferences I've, I've been at, it's about, you know, the, the best coaches are honest. They set expectations. They have uh, clear values and principles in place. That they stay true to. And so there's a, uh, uh, you know, players understand where they're coming from and they're not surprised. I think when I watch sports and you see some of the uh, uh, issues, that major issues the franchises have, it's usually due to a lack of communication, either between the coach and the GM or between the coach and the player or the GM coach and the player. But I think if you've got a seamless, uh, you know, seamless communication from top to bottom and you know exactly where you're headed and how you're going to uh, get there, then uh, th that's the formula for success. Now, easier said than done because you, you end up with egos and, you know, the, the, the expectations of management sometimes changes on the fly or expectation of ownership sometimes changes on the fly. And sometimes you get management that, you know, uh, feels strongly about uh, some younger players. Maybe the coach doesn't, but, uh, you know, our goal every day, you know, whether, you know, it's Andre Tourney and I as, as uh, partners in hockey or whether it's the coach GM being one person is making sure that everyone's on the same page. Now, you know, you just mentioned Andre. So, you know, you've been reunited with him or united with him when you made that switch over to the 67s. When that opportunity kind of came across your table, what was the first initial thoughts? Well, it was, I was excited about it for sure. And I'd known Andre. So back up to the St. Mike's days, Dave Cameron, uh, when I was coaching with him at St. Mike's in uh, 2008, nine, or 2009 and 2011, he was coaching the, he was one of the, on the staff of the world junior team. And he was the head coach in 2011 in Buffalo. Well, Andre Tourney was on the staff. So I got to know Andre, you know, through that process, if you can imagine how much work goes in the world junior team and summer mm -hmm. camps. And, you know, I was a guest coach at, at uh, one of the summer camps uh, in Toronto. And then, you know, I attended the world juniors. It was only 40, you know, what, an hour and 45 minutes away from, from our rink here. So I was back and forth. And so I got to know Andre and I get, you know, Dave spoke so highly of them and they really thought that they were similar, uh, thought similarly. So, um, and then, you know, time goes on and now Andre's coaching with Dave with the Ottawa Senators. So I was, you know, a coach GM in the OHL. I was hanging around that team. You know, anytime they came to Toronto, I'd meet up with the staff and I'd go watch them practice. And when I was in Ottawa scouting or whatever, I, I'd go and, and catch up with those guys. So I knew, I knew Andre and what he was all about. And so when that opportunity came out, I, there's a chance to work with one of the, you know, uh, uh, reputation wise one of the top guys in junior hockey and who's got you know at that time NHL experience as well so I kind of followed as a fly on the wall you know the uh, the career projection and there's a guy who's worked with you know Patrick Watt and he worked with the Colorado Avalanche and he's worked with the Ottawa Senators and he's worked with the, you know these top players and uh, you know done the Hockey Canada thing four-time uh, world junior guy at that time under 18 you name it so that 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 was an opportunity there I, you know the first thing is Hey, there's someone who's, you know, got a lot of experience. Is a really, really smart guy. Those are the people that I want to work with. You know, and, and it, it's turned out that that's been that's been exactly the case. And I mean, yeah, since you guys have you know joined a lot of success. I mean, the 67s have been a powerhouse in the regular season. You know, you make it to the OHL finals that year as well. Um, obviously, you know, things kind of got canceled, but you were looking for another probably you know really convincing run. Uh, what do you think have been a lot of key contributors to the success factor? Obviously, you know, you just mentioned Andre, but uh, yeah, I'm curious where you think you guys have really taken that next level into your game. Well, I think uh, if you were to ask Andre to answer the same question, but it's, uh, it comes back to the development. Mm -hmm. So we're fortunate in Ottawa that uh, the ownership provides us with every resource that we need. And, we, you know, we've got full-time strength and conditioning coach, full-time skills coach, uh, you know, we have all the supports for the players. And so, uh, 
you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes in, uh, goes into uh, the player development as well. But, um, you know, we're kind of, uh, we, there's no excuses. We've eliminated all excuses there. And the, and the players, we, we got some real character people that have been involved with the organization. Um, you know, we, we kind of took over a team that was half built, uh, you know, it's halfway through uh, a rebuild, but uh, some of the leadership there has been just phenomenal. So, uh, you know, when you get the flywheel going and you got, you know, top quality leaders who are, you know, have, have a, uh, a goal, uh, a clear goal in mind and they're working towards it. A guy like Sasha Chimileski who made his NHL debut, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, then that breeds success. So, you know, we, we, we provide the environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, Andre, I joke, we're like, Andre is a farmer, but I say we're like farmers. We provide the condition for growth and the players do the work, but we've got some players that have really put in the work and it's a credit to them. And I think, you know, when the team starts having success and winning is fun, uh, you know, then that just continues. So it's unfortunate. I really feel for the players here with the season, you know, this um, last season, it really felt like that was a team of destiny. You know, we'd lost to Guelph in the finals the year before with some injuries, some key injuries, uh, and really felt like, you know, that one was snatched uh, from us. And there was a special feeling when we reported for training camp in the fall that there's something about this team. You know, there was there was no fooling around. They were, they were on a mission. And then, of course, on pace to smash the all-time 67s record for wins. And... Uh, you know, some top prospects for the NHL draft, all that stuff. But there was a sense about that team that, you know, they weren't going to be denied. So that, that's what makes it, you know, even harder to take that the season was canceled because that was a special group. And you don't, you, you know, you don't, you don't see that very often, even with, you know, years and years of involvement in sport, that you see a team that does everything right. And then uh, to have their season canceled was just a shame. Mm -hmm. No, a hundred percent. I mean, realistically i've been kind of fortunate enough where i really got involved at the pinnacle of it i mean things were looking uh, fantastic and it was just kind of the timing of it all i'm curious too because there's also this other aspect of junior hockey where you know as you have guys excel and succeed i feel like as a general manager it's almost like a double-edged sword where you want to see these guys do the best that they possibly can but sometimes that means that they end up leaving your team when they, you know, still have potential years left at junior hockey, obviously the name, you know, you name Sasha, um, you know, Cody Clark is a guy who could have came back for another season, obviously, you know, yeah. in the Washington organization with Hershey, uh, even, you know, coach Andre, I I've talked to some of his former players and stuff and people think that, you know, he could be a coach in the NHL very soon. And obviously you want to see these things for people, but I feel like as a GM too, there's got to be a little bit of you're like, Oh, please don't leave me. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. You know, there's, uh, you become a victim. Yeah. Teams, uh, top teams in junior, whether it's in the QMJHL, or the OHL, or the WHL, they become victims of their own success. Mm -hmm. When you look at the top teams, you know, the teams that you know, are consistently buying for championships, they're also consistently losing their top players. <laughs> so, you know, this year, um, uh, I mean, uh, Jack Quinn and Marco Rossi both would have had a chance to play in the NHL this year, which would have been a massive blow to our organization. Uh, or is it, you know, cause that's our goal is to, you know, help them along to that opportunity. So it just, it's on the GM and the coach and the scouts and to, to work that much harder to replace those players. And when you have a, you know, a quality development program, it becomes easier. You know, you're drafting from closer to hundred percent of the pool of players that want to, uh, you know, that want to get in your environment. Uh, and you can point to the, the Chimileskis and the Rossies and the, uh, that group of player, Kevin Ball, Nikito Hachek, and, you know, Noel Hoffenbeier, and all the others. Um, and, you know, kind of your players become your, your number one recruiters if you're, uh, if you're running quality programs. So that's what we focus on is running a quality program and giving the players everything that they need to be successful. And then, you know, we'll deal with those bumps in the road. That's kind of the, uh, uh, the, the approach that we take. And there's, you know what, there's teams that do it. There's teams that are consistently at the top and, uh, you know, perennial uh, uh, championship contenders. It's really, really hard to do, but mm -hmm. that's that's what we're after. Well, it's funny too, because I think one thing that people forget with junior hockey is you're still recruiting 
because these kids, even though you draft them, they could still decide, Hey, actually, you know what, I'm going to take the NCAA route and things like that. So, you know, having those names definitely just kind of be like, Hey, like if you come here, you know, more likely you're going to be in the NHL one day. Yeah. That's the goal. And then it's also, you know, educating them on the, you know, the educational opportunities that are available in the OHL. And then, you know, uh, um, some of the supports that are in place and sitting down with the parents and, you know, ex- explaining our values and their ownership's values. And, and, you know, the fact that we have players that have played for our team that play in the national hockey league that are, you know, still going to university. Uh, and that's a possibility too. So sometimes, you know, the, the message is conveyed is major junior hockey. If you want to play in the NHL, you go to, you know, university, if you want to be a doctor, well, that's, that's, the furthest thing from the truth. I believe the high achievers are achievers on the ice and off the ice. And, you know, we, we have a, uh, an environment of excellence. And if someone wants to play for the 67th and then play in the National Hockey League and continue working towards, you know, becoming a doctor, then we fully support that. And we have everything in place for them to achieve that. So it's it. Recruiting is exactly that. The best players always have choices, you know, and those are the players that you want. Those are the players that are going to create that you know, that, that, that great environment and, uh, uh, you know, fun place to come every day. So you got to get your message out. And that's part of what we do is constantly recruiting and meeting with families and getting the message out there that this is what we're all about. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, become a destination for them. Now, one thing I want to look at, and we've talked about successes of, you know, former players and alumni, and obviously you're in developmental stages of a lot of people's careers. And, you know, to name a few, you know, you've had international experience as well, and you were on rosters that had guys like Devin Dubnik, Chris Rustique, who went on to have very successful yeah. NHL careers and are still having successful NHL careers. Then Marco Jack get picked up eight and nine in the first round. You know, Kevin Ball and Andre, they went to World Juniors together. Yeah. As somebody who, you know, gets to be a part of the developmental process for all those guys, there's, I mean, immense sense of pride. Oh yeah, for sure. So the fun, the the best part this year, um, you know, has been watching NHL, NHL games. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, I I was watching uh, la- last week. I was watching New Jersey Devils play. So you know, there's the connection between the Ottawa 67s and New Jersey Devils. At one point, we had four prospects on our team, but uh, Mike McLeod and Nathan Bastien, who are playing, you know, kind of key minutes with the Devils now, were both with us in Mississauga. So. You know, you you have the McLeod was, has always been a high flyer and you know one of the top players in his age group, and of course was a first rounder in the National Hockey League. And uh, you know, it, I'm not not surprised to see Michael in the lineup. But Nathan Bastian was a sixth or seventh rounder. Uh, you know, to Kitchener, uh, kind of gangly, you know, uncoordinated uh, big guy who really came into his own. You know, uh, and we got to watch this every day. He, of course, became a second round pick, and he's playing in the NHL. Those are those are really rewarding when you got players that maybe weren't the, the top player in their age group. Didn't you know there wasn't a lot of excitement around them in that OHL draft year, or maybe they weren't recruited to top schools, but they put in the work and they're good people, and you know they get recognized and now they're realizing their dream. And I can I watch the National Hockey League and there's you know 20 of these guys, you know that you get to see every night. You get to shoot them a text after the game and let them know, hey, you know, nice goal or whatever. Is it that that's been the funnest part for me this year? But taking kind of taking a step step back from the regular routine and able to kind of take that in and enjoy some of that. So that's been a lot of fun. No, I, I must say, uh, I, I agree. I, I'm starting to see it now. Just you know, you mentioned Sash and how he uh, started his first um, NHL game, and you know, sure enough, he goes out and gets a point right away. And to be able to text a guy like that and be like, hey, man, like. Congrats, because I have, you know, a lot of fond memories, especially with, you know, Shemilevsky giving me a, a game puck to put in the board through that playoff run and stuff. So, like, do you know that a guy like that wanted to include me in that way in a playoff run was super special? And then to see him achieve a dream, especially in San Jose, where it's almost like a backyard for him in terms of, uh, you know, where he grew up and whatnot. I definitely see that. Now, it's funny because we've mentioned the rivalries, you know, the Belleville, Kingston's and stuff like that. Now, as a GM, it's kind of weird because – 
you have to interact with all these teams and, you know, maintain a good relationship. Yeah. And it, it's funny because I remember, you know, you mentioned Wa and, and Tournier. And so last week's guest, Quinn O'Brien used to be a Husky and he was talking about the deal that occurred where I, I don't know if you remember this one, but uh, Tournier basically got Nikita Kucherov from yeah. Wa's ramparts for like a second round pick straight up because they couldn't play him. Yeah obviously having a good relationship between the two that plays into a factor, but you know, sometimes there's just, there's gotta be guys where you're like, oh, I, I really don't want to do business with you, but I almost got to do business. <laughs> What's it like, you know, obviously maintaining relationships like that. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's a certain element of like time heals all wounds, <laughs> you know, there's uh, a playoff series or, you know, an incident or a, you know, a pummeling can kind of change, maybe create some raw, raw wounds, but, a lot of the guys have been involved for a long time and mm -hmm. you develop relationships with them. And that's part of it is knowing how other GMs think or what the, what the philosophy of the organization is. And so sometimes, you know, you know, you, you, we're all partners. Like this is, this is one of the thing about the league and this is what I like about the league. And I'm sure it's no different than the NHL is, I mean, we're the Ottawa 67s and we're super competitive and we want to be at our very best, but we're also partners in the league, you know? So Mark Hunter, is a competitor, but he's also a partner of mine. And we got to work together to make sure that this is the best, best league in the world. And some of the people you're working with, uh, they're, they're so open to sharing ideas and techniques and that sort of thing. And so, you know, uh, the late Dale Howard Chuck, you know, uh, Mark Hunter, uh, you know, uh, Darian Hatcher, uh, some of the, some of the guys you come across just the wealth of experience. Uh, Stan Butler, you know, formerly in North Bay, how many years of coaching experience there? George Burnett in Guelph, you know, multiple league champion. So there's part of it where it's super competitive and yes, we want to win everything, but there's another part of it that, you know, I've known these, some of these guys for 20 years and they're friends of mine and, mm -hmm. you know, that we share ideas and we work together and that's what we're doing right now is working together to get this, this league back on the ice and get these players playing. So it's, uh, you want to be in a competitive environment. I believe that the water in the harbor raises all boats. You know, we want the best people in the league. And, and so, yeah, sometimes if we, if they lay a beating on us, a seven, one loss, I might not talk to them for two weeks, but at the end of the day, we're, uh, I, I respect them. Of course. Now I'm curious in, in the sense of just, you know, some general manager questions for you. Yeah. The process of going through a trade, of all your years of doing this, what trade have you been the most nervous for when you were orchestrating it behind the scenes? Good question. Oof, you got me on the spot now. Um, I don't, I, you know what? I think there's two, <laughs> it's too difficult because they're all so different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think that there was in, um, uh, in 2011, the year, or 2010, 2011, the year we hosted the Memorial Cup, uh, we had drafted Nick Ebert in the first round and he was a defective player. So he was, uh, he, he wasn't coming to the league. We were trying to convince him to come to the league, but it got to the point that, you know what, he's not, he's not going to play for us. So we worked out a trade with Warren Reichel in Windsor um, who had interest in Ebert, but the assets we were getting back, we needed you know, if Ebert wasn't going to play for us, we, need, we needed a defenseman and we needed we need some assets back to improve our team, the host of the Memorial Cup. So I think that that year, there was a couple of trades that, you know, when you're hosting and you're under pressure to, to ice a, a super competitive team, everyone knows it, you know? And so there's a different, almost every team has got leverage on you. So that year was particularly difficult because it's, it's just, it's hard to make trades when, everyone knows that what the end game is. So, but probably the Ebert trade was one that, uh, you know, that was the realization that, Hey, we're over, we might be over a barrel here, <laughs> you know, for the, for the duration of this season. Um, but anyway, that was, that's, that's one that sticks out because it's kind of a different year. And I think maybe one of the biggest ones that I've seen personally, just with the 67s was uh, Mikey DiPietro was obviously a big name that you brought in at that trade deadline. Yeah. Uh, the city was very excited for that. I mean, obviously he was coming off of world juniors, you know, he almost really gained this reputation of being Canada's goalie at the time. Is that all going through your head too? When it's like a name like that is like, Hey, this is also going to put butts in the seats as well, besides giving us a competitive advantage. 
Uh, yeah, there was a certain element to it there. I think that his playoff success was was the key there for us. Was you know the mm -hmm. reputation as a big game goalie and uh, you know some leadership qualities there too. I know you know being close to the situation in Windsor there. And Warren Reichel is a good friend of mine. Uh, you know Bob Bugner and and that whole group. So you know I, I kind of followed their success closely and then. You know, when you got a chance to add the best, you know, what many consider the best player at his position, but also a proven leader and someone with reputation for being involved in the community and, you know, uh, uh, being personable with fans. And when, you, when you, you've kind of got, you're checking off a lot of boxes there, you know, mm -hmm. and the fact that Windsor was open, that they were, they were looking to find him another opportunity at the championship. That was really all of the things that aligned there. Um, you know, so I think it had an impact. It was definitely excitement in the city which is great but the uh, kind of the first and foremost was addressing the needs of our team so i think that you know that was a uh it was probably tempered a little bit by the fact that he left <laughs> i think after one game was it one game left after one game to go to the world juniors yeah he actually made the trade and then he he was gone there which kind of you know dampened uh the excitement a little bit but uh, you know down the playoff run and uh, you know to finish the regular season it definitely you could feel a Mm -hmm. uh, the excitement in the city well it was funny enough because we did a episode with him a couple ones back and he was just saying how as much as he loved his time in ottawa he was like i would have loved to see what it would have been like in the sense of and i'm paraphrasing but more or less because he had to leave for the world junior so there was that stint where he had to yeah, go yeah. away uh, and then he was also an emergency call-up for the canucks as well too so it lost a few, <laughs> few games there yeah too. yeah yeah that was a there were a couple of situations there during that year where we were holding our breath, you know, like it's one thing I talked about, you know, being able to step back and be a fan, but it wasn't, uh, I didn't enjoy any of that world juniors. And then, uh, you know, I was holding my breath in the Vancouver. Uh, I mean, you're just imagining, you know, knocking wood that, you know, what, what, this something happens, he pulls a groin or something playing in the national hockey league and, you know, <laughs> it's out of our control, but. Uh, it was an interesting year for sure. That was a kind of whirlwind of activity from the time that the world juniors ended or actually from the time of the, the Di Pietro trade. And then, you know, a trade deadline adding in Kyle Maximovich and, you know, just improving our team. And then it seemed like the season was, we were in the playoffs. It seemed like it was a two weeks, you know, the season went by so fast. So I guess time flies when you're having fun, but that was a, a fun year. Now, you know, we chatted about the trades draft days looking back on all the draft days that you've had who are some guys you, you know maybe most excitement and even steals where you're like holy crap i can't believe i just got that guy right here at this time yeah you know what there's some surprises like there's some sometimes it takes a little while mm -hmm. you know to realize that i think that there was uh one of the players that comes to mind and it's more recent is uh, Nicholas Haig, you know, who's playing in Vegas right now. So similar to Nate Bastian, he was kind of a tall, lanky kid and he's a late birthday. So he's actually a full year younger than most of the players that he was playing against, but we end up taking Nick in the second round. Now he was our second pick in the second round. So, you know, we, we're still a, a kind of a guess at that point. Um, but sometimes you get a player and you realize, you know, after a few months that, Oh my goodness, he's he's a lot better than we thought, you know. <laughs> so when I talk to people now, they say, you know, some of the my friends in the league, they say, well, that was a great pick, you know. You guys picked Nick Hag thirtieth overall. I said it wasn't a great pick. We should have taken him, you know, <laughs> with our first round pick if we knew how good he was going to be. So sometimes players develop like that. He became a star defenseman, and of course now there's another player playing in the NHL and having success. And um, so you know, at the time, sometimes you don't even know what you got. But there are players that drafted, you know, later in the draft to become quality OHL players. And those same Mike's years there, we had Zach Ronaldo, who took in the 15th round. And, you know, he's still playing in the National Hockey League. So sometimes you get excited when you when you don't don't have a right to get excited. And sometimes it takes a little while to realize, uh, uh, you know, that you made the right move. But that's that's the part that I really enjoy, not the draft itself, but watching players develop over time. And sometimes the players you drafted develop somewhere else and you get to watch them and but uh, yeah, player development is my passion. You know, I, I love I love watching how players develop and, uh, you know, take the next step. Now, looking at the OHL as a whole, obviously, I'm most excited for when the guys are back on the ice, as I'm sure, you know, you're in yeah. the same way. When that 
return to play happens as you know, a uh, fan of the league GM in the league, what are you most excited for to kind of see? I know for me personally, I feel like we're being robbed of getting a chance to see what Shane Wright could be doing right now. Right. Yep. And then uh, obviously, uh, you know, biggest 67s fan right here. I, I'm a, anxiously waiting for you guys to return to see uh, how some of those guys unfold as well. Right. But yeah, yep. I'm curious as a, as a GM in the league, what are you most excited for? For me, uh, it's the older players. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got this cohort of players, like um, the overage players, the 19 year old players who are in their final year of junior eligibility and they're good players. And like I mentioned, they've done everything right. So you got, we got Cedric Andre, Mitch Holscher, Merrick Rippon, 20 year old players who, you know, have, they're fan favorites. They've been great. They, they need an opportunity. You know, this is, this is their opportunity to get back on the ice, play their final games as a 67. And it's an opportunity for the young guys to, you know, cement their spot in the lineup, but league wide, I think it's those older players uh and players you know to get an opportunity to showcase themselves for the draft but uh it's it's a chance for these guys to finish their junior career in style and i think that you know everyone's chomping at the bit i'm excited when they finally do get back on the ice i think the intensity and the pace of play is going to be tremendous because uh you know all this cooped up energy and and uh and desire is going to come out but it's it's the older players i feel for them now that they haven't been able to get back on the ice and they feel that they're being robbed of an opportunity and they're probably right but uh um you know i'm excited to provide them with that opportunity when we get a chance now uh, james i want to thank you for your time i know obviously general manager extremely busy this has been everything and, and more that i had for you uh so this is the part of the show where i just hand the show over to you so it's completely your show now you can you know chat about whatever you want life story you know whatever lessons or whatnot i mean it's uh yeah all uh, all you now well i guess you know the, the most common question i get asked from young young people looking at in the hockey is uh you know wh- what can i do uh, to get my foot in the door and so the, the advice i provide to them is you know we were talking about an industry here where so many people want to get involved, you know, and it's so different than entertainment. You know, I have a family connection here to the movie industry where, you know, everyone wants to be in movies. So it's a similar approach, but you have to be willing to start at the bottom and you have to be able to do the jobs that no one else wants to do and put in your time. And, you know, that, that's just part and parcel with it, with the industry. So if you've got, if you're open-minded and you're willing to dedicate a few years of time and, and build your reputation, and the one thing about hockey or sports in general is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a success driven industry and we recognize people who work hard. So whether it's getting on with the team in a volunteer capacity or in a an internship position or whether it's getting out and scouting, you know, for an independent scouting service that exists to, you know, build your reputation in the ranks and learn how to write scouting reports and that sort of thing. I think that, you know, having the, open-mindedness and the ability to do that is the best way into the industry, especially if you don't have a, uh, a national hockey league playing background. Right. So someone who's coming in like a young guy, like I was at one point in time, uh, you know, I mentioned I was pretty green when I got into the coaching, the coaching fraternity, but I realized quickly, you know, these guys coming out of the NHL have a PhD in hockey. You know, they, they, they know more, they know more about, or they've forgotten more about the game than I, I'll ever know. So, you know, you have to be able to, you know, self-educate yourself and fast track yourself to get to that level of, you know, proficiency. So I tell people, you know, you got to take a long-term approach. Very rare, you know, you got your Kyle Dubases that step in, you know, step in and, and you know, are in, in the National Hockey League at general manager level. And, you know, Kyle Dubas is a generational sports executive. You know, he was an agent when he was in his teens. He was, you know, he's been the stick boy. He's been the, he's, he's been everything. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a bad comparison point because, you know, those guys come around, you know, once in a lifetime. So I think that get out there, get working, network with people, show them you're willing to work hard and attend every coaching clinic and, you know, uh, read everything you can and uh, you'll deserve where you get to be. 
Well, it's funny that you mention all that because, you know, this podcast and our conversation right now is almost a testament to that in the sense where, you know, I just kind of showed up and asked more or less and, and helped out where, where I could. And then eventually, you know, just from, obviously I'm more on the social media side and the photos and everything like that. So, but being in the same buildings, we'd bump arms and stuff like that and, you know, get to chat. And I, I was very much just been a guy who was just like, Hey, yeah. Like if you need help, like I can, uh, I can help out kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Which is yeah, yeah. Well, half the battle is being on the scene uh -huh. right, and being present. And, you know, we've, I mean, even scouting positions, there's been certain times you get, you, you get a whole bunch of resumes and you, you narrow down, you know, you narrow down who, who you're going to interview, but someone comes into the interview and you know, you know, that guy, I see this guy at games all the time. You know, mm -hmm. or that's the guy that coaches the minor midget team. So there's familiarity there, right? So, you know, I, I, he's a good, he's, he's in every rink. I already know it. So that's part of it is, you know, that's half the battle is, is being present. Or if I make a couple of phone calls, you know, if I call someone and say, you know, what can you tell me about Grills? And they say, oh, you know what? He, he's a hard worker. He does this, blah, blah, blah. I don't really know him. I just observe, observe what he does with, you know with with other teams that goes a long way so i think your reputation building your reputation is a lot to do with it mm -hmm. no 100 percent. and one thing i've noticed too is the hockey world is so interconnected and it's funny because i was kind of taking it in last night when i was you know preparing to chat with you i was like and like I, I started out at this at like 15 16 years old i was just going to the rink uh i was lucky enough to kind of do some color commentary right away on like newfoundland summer game or winter games hockey and you know, eventually getting to chat with uh, senior hockey players. And, you know, some people might not look at that time as being relative to what I was up to, like, you know, being on the sidelines with you guys. But it's funny because once I got in the same room as you, that senior hockey experience, I was able to connect with you on another level because I was like, oh, yeah, like, uh, you know, Terry Ryan, right? And then, uh, yeah. you know, obviously you, that's a mutual between us. Right. And then it's almost yeah. like now I've given James something to remember me by for next time where he sees me. Right. And, and stuff like that. So it's uh, yeah, a yeah, huge uh, point there for sure. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the hockey world's so small and just by, you know, getting involved and we mentioned the Terry Ryan thing. Well, let's back up. Let's back up all the way to the same Mike's days we were talking about where Craig Mills played on the team. I played with Craig in Belleville. Craig played for the St. John's Leafs with a guy named Doug Dowell, uh, you know, who's a friend from Mississauga here. And, you know, we played against each other. Well, they played with Terry in uh, St. John, who happened to play with Danny Cleary, you know, when they were kids. And then, you know, next thing it's all, everything's interconnected. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's being involved with the game. They, these connections start to happen. And and uh, that makes part, that's part of the fun of it, you know, is... Uh, uh, you develop these relationships, some stronger than others, but when, uh, you know, you're able to help each other out and, you know, be a sounding board and, um, that's the fun part for me. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I was born in 97. So my like prime hockey fan years when I was like 10 to 14, you know, Dan Cleary was winning Stanley cups. So it was like, it was pretty yeah. surreal to, you know, to interview a guy. Cause I mean, you can probably attest to it too. The more you start working in it and it almost, your fandom almost gets a little bit removed. And now you're just like, almost, you want to be as professional as possible and you can't really kind of freak out or, or whatnot. But when I was like talking to Cleary, it's like, holy smokes, like this is a guy I idolized as a kid. Right. And now yeah, you're <laughs> interviewing him and stuff like that. It is pretty cool. I must say. Yeah. They're just, yeah. The, uh, well, like I mentioned, even some of the personnel in our league, but you know, they you realize they're just they're they're normal people, right? Mm -hmm. But I, uh, you know, the the interesting part about the Danny Clary thing too, and you talk about progression and and uh, you know career trajectory was when I was playing with Danny in Belleville. I mean, he was a star player, but he was cut from the World Junior Team, and kind of famously at the time, pretty controversial, but he was cut by Mike Babcock, you know, who could criticize his work ethic and whatever. And then fast forward, he's winning Stanley Cups as one of key players playing for Mike Babcock in the National Hockey League, you know, as a, as a hardworking player. So, you, you know, when you look at the spectrum of how things change and how players' careers kind of players adapt and their careers uh, progress, then uh, uh, it's, it, those are the type of situations I really enjoy is watching things unfold in hockey. And whether that's, you know, a player who, uh, 
uh, played for the team and then went, you know, to university and then, you know, uh, now wants a successful business in our community here. Uh, you know, I get, you know, as much enjoyment out of watching that sort of thing as I do players, you know, their hockey careers progress. So junior hockey has been good to me. I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Well, Hey James, I want to, you know, thank you again for your time. I really do appreciate it. And Hey, I even, uh, you know, thanks for, thanks for letting me tag along and not be like, who the hell is this kid from <laughs> New talking about Newfoundland all the time? Get out of here. <laughs> No, you did great work. You did great work for us, and uh, anytime we can help out. Awesome. Hey, uh, best of luck to you and the 67s. Really looking forward to, you know, watching uh, games as soon as they uh, get back to it. Thanks, Reels. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed the insight behind a general manager and kind of their thought process with a lot of things. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, stay best, kind.